Yeah, so it's been a, a month since we got together last, and uh, I hope you haven't missed it too much. But I, I hope that um, this has been giving you time to both get out, but also to maybe spend a bit of time, especially as churches have started to open up, that you've been able to find some time, maybe during the week, that you've done some reflection, and um, that has helped to um, nurture your Sunday experience. Because that's what we, you know, this has been a part of, uh, to be able to help us to nurture our Sunday experience by spending a bit of time during the week to reflect on the readings for Sunday. and. Um, Again, during COVID-19, as we spent a little bit more time, it was also to, to keep us connected. Uh, during the summer, we, don't, we haven't normally been offering Bible and beer. Uh, but again, we want to continue to keep you guys connected because we'd love to get you guys all over for our summer barbecues that we do with Holy Smokes. But um, we'll see if we might be able to do that come August. Okay, That might be a phase three situation here. Um, so we will wait to see if you do that. So let's just take a moment in prayer and asking God's blessing to come upon us as we gather this night and gather with one another um, in this time um, of our life, in this time of our uh, spiritual journey, especially as we have resumed um, the celebration of Mass in the Church. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and loving God, we thank you for gathering us uh, this evening uh, from different places, uh, from different circumstances. We ask you to be with us as we pause in our day to reflect on your word for us, especially your word as it comes to us in our Sunday readings this coming week. Open our hearts, open our minds open our ears so that we can listen and be enriched by your word as a seed planted in our heart. Send us your Holy Spirit to guide our conversations, to enlighten us, and to move us forward with hopefulness and with grace so that we can continue to be your disciples in our world, especially where your love is most needed at this time. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Isaiah 55, verses 10 to 11. Thus says the Lord, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Just take a moment to reflect on the word of God before us, the words, the message, and the meaning of Christ. This is a, a reading, a long reading, uh, from Matthew's Gospel. You'll notice on Sunday that some churches may abbreviate it at a certain point, uh, as we're invited to have that option. Um, they abbreviate it at, at verse 9. But we will listen and reflect on this whole Gospel this evening. 
So this is Matthew 13, verses 1 to 23. Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables. Listen. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Then the disciples came and asked Jesus, Why do you speak to, to them in parables? And he answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, you will indeed listen but never understand. And you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes so that they might not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear them, the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for that, what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy that such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, and in another sixty, and in another the 
Again, let's just take a moment to uh, be present to the image, be present to this parable, be present to Jesus who is teaching us a valuable and important lesson this night. All right, so why did Jesus speak in parables? I'm going to give you a poll, and it's going to appear on your screen, and I'm just going to invite you to check off all that you think is a reason. Why did Jesus speak in parables? Why did Jesus speak in parables? It was something everyone could understand. He was trying to confuse people. He tried to make his message crystal clear. Was it because the people weren't educated? Was it because Jesus liked to speak in riddles? He didn't want the scribes and Pharisees to know what he was saying. All right, just a couple more seconds there. So why did Jesus speak in parables? Hey, the majority of you saw it as something that everyone could understand. None of you said that he was trying to confuse people. He tried to make his message crystal clear. Yeah, he tried to make his message crystal clear because the people weren't educated. This is your second highest. We'll come back to that one. Uh, because one of you thought Jesus liked to speak in riddles. I think he did sometimes. And he didn't want the scribes and Pharisees to know what he was saying. So that one, and because the people weren't educated. It's true that a number of people that would have been in the crowd were maybe peasants, farmers, fishermen, and so forth. But he didn't just try to um, appeal to them. He spoke in parables, and I'll get into this a little bit more. He spoke in parables, yes, to make it a clear message. But as we'll see as we look at this particular parable, parables allowed you to speak more directly with a larger message behind just the words. And I think this is why the disciples are like asking, you know, why do you use parables? This just doesn't, um, why do you speak in parables like that? Uh, however, Jesus used the parables to teach. Even though Jesus explains the details of the parables, the par this particular parable to the disciples, it still remains a parable. It's a teaching about more than just the words itself. There's more than what meets the eye. A parable never fits into a simple lesson plan. Um, what is left unsaid is what will come for the future, for the future harvest. And that is just as important is what is said. Jesus' parable about the sower, the seeds, and the soil invites us to think more about what happens to us when we hear the word of God. Okay? And we hear that quite clearly in Jesus' words, his explanation to the disciples. Now, every night, and I did it tonight already, I water my little garden. You know, tomatoes, peppers, zucchinis, cucumbers, uh, beans, green beans, and fennel, a whole bunch of herbs. Um, I've been very conscious and conscientious, I guess, uh, like many people who have taken uh, up the task of planting this summer, you know, about what I've planted and the particular conditions we're planting in. 
takes a whole bunch of preparation to get a garden going. Um, and then monitoring how dry the soil is, uh, especially this past week or so. It's remarkable that, uh, that just maybe one change, a simple change in conditions can just ruin everything. Even too much water for a plant can kill it because the roots start to rot. Watering during the heat of the day can also kill because it burns the plants. The plants are all hot because they're in the sun, 34 degree weather, and the heat, the sudden cold, it would shock you, shock, shock me, so it shocks the plants. So also watering during the day, the plant doesn't benefit from it because it just evaporates. So you have to know when and how in order to be a good gardener. And the parable about the sower here that we hear about in Matthew's gospel, it's said to be probably the first parable that Jesus ever taught in public. So he had to try and make it believable and understandable. This text is practically word for word then from where he received it as its source from the Gospel of Mark, which, as we have said before, is older than Matthew's Gospel. The only thing Matthew actually does is he takes Mark's Gospel of this passage and inserts that passage about from Isaiah. And he probably did so because Matthew was writing to a Jewish community, and it was very important to back up, to substantiate everything with scripture, okay? So we have this old text, which indicates it was probably one of the earliest parables. So what better way to do this, to, to share this story, than to, appeal, than to appeal to the culture and to their society? The people, they understood the cycles of life and death. They understood farming. They understood what it meant to sow seed, to harvest, much like most of us do, probably if we've ever planted something before. And whether we have a green thumb or not, we may have killed it. We may have brought it to fruition. But the people in Jesus' time didn't have all the fancy machinery that perhaps farmers of today actually have access to. But like all parables, we're meant to learn or understand about ourselves. This is a particular parable that is called a mirror parable because it makes us look into the words and to see ourselves in the image that it presents. And we can all understand from the passage that we are the ground, we're the soil. God is the sower, sowing the seed in us, the ground, giving us gifts, the word of God. But the question we're called to reflect on is, how are we the soil? Are we rocky? Are we dry? Are we filled with thorns? Or are we ready to receive the gift of the seeds, the gift of life, and to allow it to grow once it's planted? That's the basic understanding of the parable. How is the soul? Can it receive the word of God? But Jesus is trying to get somewhere deeper in his explanation. This theme brought out in actually all the readings, we just focused on the first reading in the gospel today, being rich in meaning for us. It highlights this cycle of life, this circle of life. Uh, first of all, like 
life, like rain and snow, comes from God. We hear that in Isaiah. It is not our doing. We don't make rain. We don't make snow. It's not a, a creation of our intellect or our desires. Therefore, it's a reminder that all things, life, it's a mystery. And it's not something we, we, we don't understand. We understand rain and the water cycle and so forth. But there's an inherent mystery uh, contained in it. And there is more to ourself than we can understand on the surface. It is also a mystery. And it's in the mystery of God's creation and the mystery within us where God resides. Secondly, we wait. The seed, when it falls, it takes time to germinate. Depends on how we take care of the seed. It will eventually grow and bear fruit. But we have to wait. Life in Christ is not an immediate fix. It's a journey towards a fulfillment that comes with a lot of self-care, a lot of patience, a lot of tending, helping the plant, us as the, the plant that's growing to be uh, nurtured and cared for in the right way. So in our spiritual journey, we're called to wait, to be patient. Thirdly, it's a reminder for us that we're a people of hope. It seems that Jesus' original purpose in speaking this parable was to assure everyone, yeah, the harvest will be plentiful, despite the poor soil at times, or perhaps the thorns or the hazards from people walking into the field. There was certainty, and there was certainly enough good soil to assume, to assure a harvest of plenty. And that is the hopefulness that even though the thorns are going to be there, even though sometimes it's going to be on not good soil, the harvest of plenty will come. Finally, we're made aware, especially in our, this gospel parable, that there is a warning placed on this whole image, this whole theme. Jesus is saying, be careful where you're planted. Be careful how you take care of the soil. We don't have control over this cycle of life but we do have control over the soil, which is us. Keep ourselves free of the, the weeds and the thorns. Tend to our own soil. When the weeds and the thorns of life, they grow, but when people walk all over them, sow the seeds of God's grace so that they can find a home to grow and flourish, and that its roots may take hold of our inner core. It all comes back to the question of whether or not we're, we're faithful to this cycle of life. We will experience different times when it is easy to tend the soil, and sometimes when it feels like an absolute chore. Times when life is all around us, and sometimes when we're just surrounded by death and grief, and it seems to tug on us and pull us at our roots. But we're called to be faithful to always return to the sower of the seed. That way, things can't really go wrong. Our life is a cycle. For those of you that may be around my age, you already know how our life changes in cycles. For those who are younger than me, most of you, you're probably living those life changes now. But don't 
necessarily have that experience to recognize the ups and the downs as part of a cycle for your life. These last few months for all of us have been such a disruption to what we understand those predictable patterns, those, that cycle of life. But history teaches us that this time is just another experience of the cycle of life for us, for our humanity. God has been through this before with our human race. This, you know, whether you want to focus on the, you know, the pandemic, the diseases, the, you know, it's been part of who we are. We just think it's only ever happened once because it's only happening to us now. But, and it's an extreme. So again, God has been there with us as a people. He continues to be with us. It's all about us being faithful to that. If we remember to try and be faithful, if we tend our soil well, and we, and we will come to, and we will welcome that seed that God gives us through the gift of his word among us, and the gifts of God's Holy Spirit that comes to us like fire, just like the fresh rain helps us to grow. So cultivate a harvest from your heart. Do what you need to be good soil, to take in God's word so that the rain of God can grow. I know I just froze there. There we go. So to cultivate a harvest from your heart, do what you need to do to be good soil, to taking God's word so that the rain of God can grow and grow and grow. We might get confused by the parables, by faith, by Jesus' teaching at times, just like the disciples. But the questions that arise from the parables, they allow our hearts to become more open and receptive because they become more curious. They perceive the answers that might be there before them. A parable is not an action plan. It's not a law or a set of directives or, or advice. It's more of a door opener. It's almost like a mic drop. Like you say something and you drop the mic, and Jesus go, goes out after the parable, and everybody's just left wondering, what did it all mean? And what does it mean for me? So a parable is a door opener that opens the heart in order to perceive and understand more. That's why, you know, when I use the, it's a mirror parable, it's because the parable is like a mirror placed in front of us. And we're called to see ourselves in that parable. It's taking an honest inventory. You know, it's quite amazing when you look at, a number of the parables. And in your small groups, you're going to ask this, or you're going to reflect on this question. Um, you know, what are the parables that, that really teach you something to go beyond just the words, that give you an aha moment? I understand why Jesus is saying this. And most of the time, it feels like the parable is actually written for yourself. That's how you know it's touching you. Now, one more poll before we go to questions, we go to the small groups. This poll is asking, how do you describe yourself? Uh, Santo, yeah. could you also tell us what was the right answers from the last poll? Um, hold on one second here, my face keeps freezing. I would say from the, okay, let me put that back up here. Share results. Can you see that? Okay. Um, I would say 
Obviously, Jesus didn't try to confuse people. That's obvious. Uh, Jesus didn't like to speak in riddles. That wasn't his intention. Um, he also, the last one, he didn't want the scribes and Pharisees to know what he was saying. That's not true either. Like, he wanted them to figure, he wanted them to understand. Um, also, why did he speak in parables? Because the people didn't understand, weren't educated. That's assuming people just didn't have the smarts. No, that wasn't his intention. His intention was to get the learned to understand, the learned to understand, and the not very learned to also understand, to bring, to bridge the gap so that everyone knew. Because religion and the law, the knowing of the law, was really something that brought you to be exclusive in among the people, okay? It's like the educated. So Jesus isn't just speaking to the educated. He's speaking to the educated and to the non-educated to bridge the gap that the word of God is, is, is for both, okay? So it was something everyone could understand. That's probably the best answer, and that's probably the right answer. So if it's something for everyone to understand, then he wasn't trying to confuse people. Yes, he was trying to make his message crystal clear, um, in a, presuming that the people weren't educated, no, he was trying to everyone to understand. And then the others, the other, the last two are, you know, not necessarily true either. Does that make sense? Yep, that makes sense. Okay, let me get the other one. There we go. Now, this poll, I should have given you. I could edit it, but I'd have to go to the website to, to do it. But the second, will, the second poll is, how might you describe yourself? So I'm going to ask you to pick one. Now, this is just one, and it is anonymous. Where do you describe yourself? Are you the path where seeds fell and the birds ate, came and ate? Are you the rocky ground where there was little soil? Are you thorny ground where the plants grew? Not sure why the rest aren't there. Uh, where the plants grew but were choked, okay? And finally, are you good soil? So answer one. I should have put uh, an option for, well, I'm kind of the path, but I'm also the thorny ground. I'm also, you know what I mean? Like you could see yourself in many ways. But if you had to pick one, which one would it be? Okay. One person is feeling like they're the path where seeds fell and the birds came and ate them up. The majority of you are feeling like rocky ground. Again, where the, there was little soil and a, a plant didn't have enough roots to grow doesn't mean that the seeds it doesn't mean the seeds didn't grow okay that's important this isn't an all or nothing exercise if you're rocky ground there was not enough soil to let it um, endure the harshness because it didn't it couldn't be some of you feel like your thorny ground. Again, the seed does take root, but whatever is there chokes the plant. And finally, the good soil. Um, some of you are feeling like you're on pretty good ground with the, the soil that is your life right now. You know, it's really funny because I, when I was getting the garden ready in the backyard, I bought soil, like, you know, I was trying to build up the bed a little bit more, and I bought soil, and you assume the soil is starting off to be good soil, okay? But everywhere I put that soil, I got the same weeds growing in abundance the same, whether it was patching on grass 
or whether it was in the garden, I had to pluck them all out. And it, and it, and it goes to show, uh, and even in the, the results that you guys are sharing, sometimes there's going to be weeds, sometimes there's going to be thorns, sometimes it's going to be rocky. There, I don't think we live life every day as good soil. But it is important that the seeds are still being given. It's not as though because we're rocky ground that God doesn't gift us with what we need. And I think that's important for us to remember. Because when we're feeling pretty crappy about whatever's going on, God is still giving the seeds. It's almost like, and I often say this, God is being faithful even when we aren't. I think that's something we have to remember. Just going to stop sharing that here. And I will find for you your question. Jesus could have taught more directly. Like laws and precepts. How does teaching in parables draw you closer to know God and God's will for you? How is it stretching your heart? How is it making you think differently than just a law that's, that's given? Secondly, uh, what obstacles exist in your life to receiving God's word? You know, we talked about the soils. We talked about the, the whole meaning of the parable about these obstacles that exist from not only receiving God's word, but from allowing it to nurture and bear life. And finally, what other parables of Jesus do you find inspiring to your spiritual journey, your spiritual life? Okay? Make sense? Clear as mud? Okay, I'm going to split you up for maybe about 15 minutes and, and I'll come around and visit you.